All right, so this is, this, I believe this is week 11, so welcome back. Uh, we, last week, we went through quite a bit. If you didn't, if you weren't here, please make certain you go back and watch the video. It's out on YouTube. Uh, we covered Revelation 14, 15, 16. Uh, <clears throat> what's that? 13, 14, no, 14, 15, 16, because we're doing 17 and 18 tonight. Didn't we? Did we do the vials of God's wrath yet? Have we covered the vials of God's wrath? See, I didn't think we covered No? We didn't do the vials of God's wrath? Okay, well, we'll start with 16 tonight then. We've got three chapters to get through, so let's get started. <laughs> 18 is actually a pretty quick one, but let's get let's get jumping here. I, I'm glad you guys kept me on track because for whatever, reason, for whatever reason, I was thinking that we had... Uh, yeah. I was thinking that we had uh, covered the vials of God's wrath already, so... 16, Revelation 16 we'll start with tonight, yeah. So let's pray and we'll get started, all right? Lord, thanks for today. God bless this time we have together. Please give us grace as we get through the 16, 17, and 18 tonight. Uh, Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that uh, you teach us. We declare that Jesus is Lord. Um, Jesus is Lord over this house. He's Lord over our lives. Uh, Holy Spirit, we pray that you come and be with us. Just open our hearts and our eyes to be able to receive and uh, Jesus said that you'd teach us everything and that you remind us of everything that he said. And so we pray that you do that. And we just say you're welcome here. God, come and be with us and let us just really have an enjoyable time together tonight, Father. Amen. 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 All right. So uh, last week, I guess, I'm sorry, uh, we ended up uh, we ended up talk or leading into the seven plagues. And I guess what I did was I read uh, the first two verses of 16. That's probably what threw me off because I was get, making the point at the end of last week's class, we were talking about the timing. That's what it was. So we were talking about the timing. One of the last questions that happened last week was that we were talking about the timing of the revelation when things were happening. And one of the points that I was making, and I'll remake now, I'll restate it now, is that uh, when we get to the seven vials of God's wrath, we are uh, already in the kingdom of the beast. So... The, the seals being opened lead us into a series that, see, that appears to me to match Matthew 24. If you remember going from Matthew 24 through 14 and looking at what Jesus said, uh, said, be not deceived, right? Uh, there'll be wars and rumors of wars, plagues, famines, pestilences in diverse places. This is the beginning of sorrows. You'll be delivered up and be killed, right? Those, if you look at what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 4 through 14, it, it ends up following the seals of the revelation and then <clears throat> we talked about interstitial uh, chapters and verses and we uh, we use the example of jesus uh, parable of the fig tree he's talking about the end times he stops and says remember the parable of the fig tree and then he keeps going with the end times right interstitial it's that inserted logic or that inserted narrative that happens when somebody's teaching or the book of the Revelation follows the interstitial process, right? So if you can imagine, think back, and I'm not saying that this is why it was done. The Lord may have inspired the writing of the book this way, right? It could be that that's the case. I can't tell you the mind of God on this. I can only tell you an observation. But if you can put yourself back 2,000 years ago and you've got a piece of papyrus and a quill pen because there was no word processor, there was no spell correct, right? Gratefully for the people who lived back then, there was no such thing as a dictionary. So uh, you can thank Noah Webster for that. He's the first person to have created one. Prior to that, there really wasn't standardized ways of writing words. Most of the times they were phonetic for whatever language, but there were commonalities to the language. But if you can imagine writing, uh, although, yeah, anyways, uh, if you can imagine writing uh, and you're like, and I saw this, 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 and then you're thinking, oh man, I need to explain that. Explain, 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 explain. Okay, where did I leave off? Right there. I saw this, I saw this, I saw this, I saw this, right? So you see these circumstances through the Revelation where you have this narrative that unfolds, and then you end up with this interstitial area of clarity, or color, or action, or definition. And then it picks up where it left off and it keeps going and then you see more of this, right? We've seen that a number of times through the Revelation so far. Uh, the Revelation is not in chronological sequence. Um, I think currently at this point in my life, based on what I've read and studied, my perception is, um, and this is based on about 2,000 hours plus 
study of the end times. That's where I'm at, a little over 2,000 hours at this point. Uh, I, I think that the, at, at a minimum, the vials of God's wrath and the trumpets of God are like interlocking circles that have a common piece that's somewhere in the middle of them, where you've got these two circles like the, like the uh, Olympic sign, you know how the rings interlock, interlock with each other? Where those two circles interlock, that little piece in the middle, I think is the fifth, sixth, and seventh sea, uh, trumpet and the fifth, sixth, and seventh vial of God's wrath. They seem to be talking about the same thing. Uh, and we'll, we'll touch on that briefly tonight, but I would almost even go, be willing to say that the, possibly the fifth, sixth, and seventh seals also overline them. So it may be that the end of the revelation that you've got this strain of happenings, this strain of happenings, and this strain of happenings, and when they get to the very end, they just overlap each other like that. That's what it seems to me, right? So you'll have to read it and see if you agree or disagree, right? And let me know what you think. Let's talk about the seven vials of God's wrath, and let's jump in. Chapter 16, verse 1. I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your way and pour out the vials of, of, wrath, of the wrath of God upon the earth. So we've got the, we have seven angels that blew the trumpets, right? And uh, let's keep reading and see if we can figure out if there's anything that tells us what these angels, uh, tells us anything about who these angels may be. And the first one went and poured out his vial on the earth, and there fell... Oh, you know what? Let's go back a chapter real quick. Uh, in chapter 15, it says this. Um, the seven angels came... on Chapter 15, verse 6, I just want to retouch this real quick. The seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven last plagues, clothed in pure white linen, having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts that was in front of the throne gave the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, which lives forever and ever. So there's a difference here between the plagues and the wrath. The plagues of God are one thing, but the Lord added wrath to it. Right? He gave, it says that, it says that the four beasts gave the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God. So they already had plagues, but the Lord added wrath with it. Um, as we start here, the first one you're going to see is starts when the beast kingdom happened. We'll revisit when that time frame would be. The first went out, chapter 2 of 16, the first went out and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men that had the mark of the beast and on those that worshipped his image. So by the time we get to the first vial of God's wrath... We have people who have been marked by the, who have taken the mark of the beast, right? And people that have worshipped his image. Which means that the beast has to be in his kingdom and the image has to be placed. We know that the image is placed, that when the image is placed, according to uh, Daniel and according to the Revelation, that we've got 1,260 days. The beast rules for 1,260 days. His, that final kingdom goes for 1,290, according to Daniel chapter 12. So the kingdom outlasts the beast, or it starts before we know who the beast is, which is maybe even more likely. could be that the kingdom begins, that he's behind the scenes doing what he's doing, that he's given power when he sets his image up in the holy place, and that begins the 1,260 days. So we might have a month <clears throat> prior to him taking a final public position. And then, uh, and then after that, I'm going to move a little bit here that better <clears throat> and then after that we end up having the 1260 days that the beast rules so we know at this point that the beast kicked off his 1260 days because he set his image up in the holy place we know that it takes time we talked last week about the possibility of um, uh, the world how the world responded to COVID how quickly the world saw a need and unilaterally decided to meet that need with outcomes, right? Uh, and so they're like, we're going to make masks available, we're going to do lockdowns, we're going to have shots, we're going to do whatever we need to do to make certain that public health is maintained, in our opinion, and we will therefore institute these circumstances globally. It wasn't just a place, it was the global economy, right? And so when we look at that, we can see in our lifetime, we can see how quickly a global effort can actually formulate and be carried out. It was only a matter of months 
before we started seeing some very substantial changes in our culture. This, I think, will be the same thing. At the point that the beast man takes position, it will kick off a series of global events and people will start getting marked. People will start getting, taking, their, you know, they will begin responding to take the mark or don't buy or sell. And I don't think it'll take long. I think people are going to line up just like we saw for COVID. People were lined up for PCR tests. They were lined up for inoculations and so on and so forth. I think it'll be the exact same thing, that there'll be this global effort and people will just jump into the script. They'll just respond. And so I don't think it'll take much time. So the reason I'm saying that is we're going to give ourselves maybe four months. Let's just add four months to it. So the beast shows himself. Within four months, we probably are at a point where this scripture could actually happen. Because there will be people on the earth who have been marked, who have chosen to take the mark, and people at that point who will have chosen to worship the beast. So we can use what we know, right, to help us understand global economies of scale and so on and so forth. So I would say at this point we're talking no, no, no less than, I don't think it will be less than this, but I bet it's within the first three or four months of the beast's rule of that 1260 days. So we're already three and a half months or three and a half years plus maybe four months into the tribulation period by the time this verse by the earliest time this verse could happen. And this is the first vial? This is the first vial of God's wrath, right? So, the, the trumpets now, they could have happened well before the beast ever took his kingdom. because the, well, And they do, for that matter, because the first four happened before the beast is allowed to come out of the bottomless pit. The bottomless pit, the beast, the king, uh, the king of the bottomless pit, known as Abaddon and Apollyon, doesn't emerge until the fifth trumpet. So we've got the first four trumpets where there is no beast. Right? We have a, we have, I think what we have is a person who looks like a Christian, who appears to be a Christian person, is accepted by Christian communities, uh, and who, for all intents and purposes, appears to be a pro-Judeo-Christian individual who, after the fifth trumpet, will end up, uh, will end up spinning on a dime and then becoming what we, the person we know as the final beast rule. That's what I think is going to happen. The fifth trumpet has to happen before the first, first vial can, is what I'm saying. Okay. So whether this happens in the fifth, sixth, or seventh trumpet, I can't tell you that. Mm -hmm. but, it's, but, it ha but the fifth trumpet has to happen before the first vial can, because the beast kingdom doesn't exist until the fifth trumpet. And the fifth trumpet is when the beast comes out of the bottomless pit. That's when the beast comes out of the bottomless pit, yeah. And we're going to substantiate that here by the time we get into chapter 17. We'll talk about why we know that to be true. <clears throat> okay, so verse 3. The second angel poured out his vial on the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. Okay, so here we have a pretty gross uh, uh, outpouring of the wrath of God. If you can imagine cottage cheese, that's painted red. And you have oceans full of red cottage cheese, that's what this is saying. Because the blood of a dead man is clotted blood, right? Blood of a live man is live, it's red, flowing, liquid. The blood of a dead man is clotted, brownish, Right? So just to be legit and gross, what we're talking about here are oceans of red cottage cheese curds. And inside that, the oceans, all of the fish die. Nothing is, now we have nothing. So what is the collateral damage of that? We were talking about death experiences before. What is that? The death experience that we're having with this now is that uh, every entity that makes its living and every individual who makes their sustenance off of fish, which is co our coastal regions throughout the world, China, Japan, Taiwan, right? Heavily fish-oriented cultures. Uh, East Coast, West Coast, lots of fish, lots and lots of fish. Uh, any coastal area, lots of fish. We have a lot more beef, chicken, right? Lamb, goat, things like that in the Midwest, but if you're on the edge of the ocean, you're going to be eating a lot more fish. All that food supply is officially gone. Yes, sir? So no more omega fish oil? Yeah, I wouldn't take it personally. Yeah, no more omega fish. And who knows, you know, I mean, and then you think about, again, I'm just, I'm using, we're using our imagination to think this through. If the fish die, they end up bloating, they float to the top. Now you're going to have all these dead, I mean, billions of dead carcasses of creatures floating onto the ocean shores. Think about that. The stench, the disease right? You're adding disease now. I'm just trying to bring logical conclusions to something like this happening. Uh, verse 4, the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. Who do we know in the history of the scripture that turned things, that turned water into blood? Moses. It's one of the reasons why 
Many people believe that Moses is one of the last, is one of the final prophets, one of the two prophets. It's also one of the reasons why I asked the question, could these final vials of God's wrath that are being poured out be a byproduct of the interactions of the prophets on the earth? Are they prophesying these things and what we're seeing is that the heavens are responding, right? I don't know the answer to that and scripture doesn't tell us. But it's interesting to me that when we're, when we're told about the prophets, it says that these two were given power to shut up. Hi, Robert. These two were given power to shut up uh, the heavens so that they would not rain and to cause water to be turned into blood, right? We're told that when we're told about the two prophets earlier on. And we're seeing these kinds of plagues now happen with the, Trump, with the uh, vials. So I don't know, but I, my, in the back of my mind, I'm wondering... Are the two prophets alive during this time? And are these outpourings of things that maybe they're involved with? I don't know. It's just a thought. <clears throat> and I heard verse 5. I heard the angel of the waters say, You are righteous, O Lord, which was and will be because you have judged this way. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink because they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar saying, Even so, Lord Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched by the great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, which had the power over these plagues, and they did not repent or give him glory. Now stop and look at this. Here you have a recognition that humanity realizes that God is responsible for performing these things, right? God is responsible. They recognize that God is doing it, but they chose not to repent, and they chose instead to tell God, how dare you? How dare you do this? An obvious lack of understanding of who God is, right? <clears throat> it says, and they repented not to give him glory. The fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, <clears throat> And his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. When was there a time of darkness? Do we have a plague of darkness anywhere? Yeah. Absolutely we do. Moses again, right? They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they repented not of their deeds. Again, they recognize the God of heaven <clears throat> is doing this. <laughs> Excuse me. The God of heaven is doing this. And they are refusing to repent. Verse 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial on the great Euphrates River, and the water there was dried up, that the kings of the east might be prepared, or that the, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Uh, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, which is Satan, out of the mouth of the beast, which is the final world ruler, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now stop and think before we go any further. John saw demon spirits come out of the mouth of Satan, the mouth of the man who's the final world, world ruler, and the mouth of the little, of the, I call him the little beast because it says that he had the horns of a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. Scripture just says he's a beast. But out of that little guy, right? demon spirits came out of their mouths where so if they came out of their mouths where were the demon spirits before in dwelling. they were inside right you can't come out unless you've been in demons dwell in human bodies they want human bodies to live in not every you know not every sickness that we run into is just purely physical or mental or emotional Demonic spirits can dwell inside of humans. Jesus, what did Jesus do? It says he went around casting out demons, healing the sick, and delivering all of those who were oppressed of the devil. That's what Jesus' ministry was. What was it? Casting out demons, healing the sick, and delivering those who were oppressed of Satan. So has that changed? Jesus, what, what, it, what has happened? On, what would have happened on the earth for that to have stopped? other than the fact that we don't like to think about it or believe it. I don't think there's anything. I mean, I haven't seen anything in my scripture that says that things have changed after the death and resurrection of Jesus with the unsaved world. 
As a matter of fact, Jesus even talks about this. He says, when an unclean spirit leaves a man, it seeks, it seeks places, it wanders around desert arid places, seeking a place to rest. And when it does not find a place to rest, it goes back to the man that it left. <clears throat> and if it's allowed in, it invites seven more friends of its own, and that person's state is worse than it was before. I have dealt with people that have been demonized. I have been part of praying for the deliverance of individuals. I have been, I have prayed for someone when I had him look at me and say, I'm not coming out. And I said, yes, you are in the name of Jesus. Shut up and come out of this man. And I'm telling you, demons are real. They are very real. And us not believing them is the, us, we, as the church or anybody that's watching this video, not believing they're real is exactly what they want. Because as long as you don't believe they're real, they can stay where they are and you're going to treat it with medication or something else. I, I myself have gone through a time of deliverance in my life for deep issues, stuff I struggled with. And I kept asking the Lord, I'm like, Lord, set me free from this. I don't know where I've opened the door, but let me, let me go from this, set me free from this. And the night that the Lord set me free was an amazing, beautiful night. It was awesome. I'm just telling you that there's an old book. If you want to read a book that's really interesting on this topic, it's called Pigs in the Parlor. It's been around for years. Uh, go grab that book, find a copy of it somewhere, and challenge yourself. Uh, it's really interesting, very interesting. But I will just say this. Our responsibility is to do the works of Jesus. Jesus says, greater works than you, greater works than I will you do when I leave. You will do greater works. You will do greater works. And if Jesus cast out demons, healed the sick, and, took, and delivered those who were oppressed of the devil, then that means that we have to do that and surpass it. We have the ability with him indwelling us to be able to do what he did plus more. So we're going to keep going. <clears throat> These demons now come out of the mouths of the false prophets, the dragon and the beast. It says they're spirits of devils working miracles which go forth to the kings of the earth of the whole world, the whole world, to gather them together to battle for the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Interesting that Jesus would say that. Behold, I come as a thief. Where else do we see that? For the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens will burn with fervent heat. Peter wrote that. So here we are. Jesus is saying, behold, I come as a thief. It's an index. It's a tag. It's like when Jesus was on the cross, what did he say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did God actually forsake Jesus on the cross or not? No, because if you go a chapter before that, Jesus said, my father never leaves me. So either Jesus lied or we're not understanding. And if you look at the whole of Scripture, you realize that Jesus and the Father were never apart from each other and that God never left Jesus. You see that Jesus is actually quoting a psalm and he's giving an index. And he's giving this one verse. And it's triggering the rest of that psalm for everybody that knows it. Every one of the rabbis, I guarantee you, knew what Jesus was saying. Because if you go read that psalm, Psalm 21, 21, uh, thank you. The rest of that psalm talks about they parted my clothing. They're, they, they treat me as, you know, they're dogs uh, rummaging around me. They, they cast lots for my clothing. The whole of Psalm 21 is talking about what Jesus is going through. And it's Jesus saying, this is being fulfilled in your hearing. It was an index scripture. Jesus had another one. I'm trying to remember what it was. Psalm 30 something, 132, um, where Jesus says it is finished. 22? 22? Psalm 22 was the first one? Yeah. Okay. And there's another one in the 30s later on. I don't have it in front of me. But it's where Jesus says it's finished. And it's, again, it's an index scripture. The very last verse that, or the very last thing Jesus said on the cross was an index scripture back to that psalm. And if you go back and read that psalm, once again, you see Jesus talking about what's going on right then. So we have these things uh, that are index scriptures. And Jesus uses index scriptures. And this is an index scripture. Jesus says, behold, I come as a thief. We're, Jesus is saying, you know what, at this point in history with the vials that are going on, uh, we are at the sixth vial right now, and Jesus is saying, my return is very close. Not the appearing of the Son of Matthew 24, but the coming of the Son in Matthew 25. The day of the Lord. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together in a place of the Hebrew tongue called Armageddon. And that's where that battle is going to take place. So 
Just real quick, a couple of battles that we know of in the end times that are pretty big names. The Battle of Armageddon and the Battle of Gog and Magog. The Battle of Armageddon happens when Jesus comes back in, Re in Revelation 19. The Battle of Gog and Magog happens at the end of the Millennial Kingdom. So the thousand-year reign is done. And it's the Battle of Gog and Magog at the very end where it's not Russia. In, it's not Russia. A lot of times you might have heard people say, well, Russia's going to invade Israel. And it might. But the Gog-Magog battle doesn't happen for another thousand plus years. The get Battle of Armageddon is the one that's first. He gathers them together in the place of the Hebrew tongue called Armageddon. The seventh angel pours out his vial into the air. There came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. This is the seventh vial. Seventh vial. There were voices, thunders, lightnings, and there was great earthquakes, such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. So just in case you look at this earthquake and want to compare it to other earthquakes, D, this is a different earthquake. <clears throat> so much so that John wrote, don't get this one confused with other ones. Because we've already had this before, right? We've already had voices, thunders, lightnings, and earthquakes. We've already had that at least two or three times prior to this. But this one is unique and different in and of itself because here's what it says. The great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. We know that this can't be the same earthquake that we experienced in the sixth seal, because in the sixth seal... Men hid in the mountains and the rocks and the crags, saying, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the Lamb, for the day of the wrath of the Lord is here. So this is different than the one that we saw at the sixth seal. The sixth seal, at the sixth seal, that's at the sign of the coming of the sun, Matthew 24. This is the earthquake that happens at the coming of the sun, Matthew 25. It says, every island fled, fled, fled away. Hawaii no longer exists. Taiwan, right? Take your pick. Pick your favorite island and go try to find it on a map. It won't be there, right? Not only that, but uh, the Rocky Mountains leveled. Pretty crazy. The mountains are no more. This says the mountains were not found. That means that elevation 11,000 feet is elevation 400 feet. Right? So what happens to them? We're not told. We don't know if they, if they fall into the earth and they just level out. We don't know if they break into shards and are scattered across the face of the earth. We don't know. All we know is that when you go try to look for the Rocky Mountains, they won't exist. They're gone. So this is legitimately, when scripture says everything that can be shaken will be shaken, that is really what it means. The heavens and the earth fully shaken. And there fell on men hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, which is 100 pounds. So think about this. A gallon of water is roughly uh, 10 pounds, give or take some change. So you're talking a 10 gallon, take 10 gallons of water, freeze them in your freezer, tie them together with a big piece of string and throw it on your roof at 160 miles an hour. Because that's about how fast they're going to be falling by the time gravity does its deal. I'm imagining there'll probably be some hail damage. <laughs> right? I would imagine that every tree will be stripped, every home will be demolished. I mean, depending on how many of these hailstones fall at a time, right? If it's just one every 300 feet, that's one thing. If, the, if it's one every 15 feet, that's a different thing altogether, right? But if you can imagine binding together 10 frozen gallons of water and dropping that from a high altitude so that it accelerates, right? Over 100 miles an hour, you can imagine probably going to be a pretty damage, pretty, pretty great damage. <laughs> and men blasphemed God, the second half of 21, because of the plague of hail, for the plague thereof was exceedingly great. 
So when I see exceedingly great, I'm thinking it's more than one hailstone every 300 feet. I'm thinking it's quite a bit. And the only place that you'll be safe, there, you can't hide in the mountains because there are no mountains, right? That, like my little, my little, my little uh, storm, storm, storm shelter is about the only place you probably would be safe. It's got a small enough footprint, iron lid. You know, a 100-pound hailstone hitting that would make a really loud noise. It probably didn't pretty good, but I bet you'd probably be able to survive it if you were underground. But how many people are going to be able to do that, right? But it says great hail. Yeah. Doesn't that usually mean a lot? That's what I'm saying, yeah. It, uh, the plague of hail, the plague thereof was exceeding great. So that's what I'm saying too, uh, June. I think the same thing. I think it was exactly like that. The other night. Yeah, Only maybe. Each. So, so anyways, there you go. There's Revelation 16. So here's God trying to get the final, like this is his final push. It is his, it's the vials of the wrath of God that are being poured out on mankind. Now you'll notice nowhere in the vials of wrath do we see anything about Christians. Just an observation. Uh, we don't see anything about believers during that time in there. I personally think, this is just me, I can't prove this at all. <clears throat> but based on what I know right now, and putting all the pieces together, uh, I think that the sign of the appearing of the sun is toward the end of the beast kingdom and that the catching away of the church happens and that these vials happen after the church is gone. I think this part happens after that. Uh, only, only because it seems... That there, should, that there would be some reference somewhere in here about the remnant or something, right? And I don't, there's nothing. There's nothing that says, and the remnant gave glory to God. There's nothing like that, right? So, uh, so I'm thinking that this part happens in a very small period of time, like maybe over the span of 30 days that these vials of God's wrath happen back to back to back. And I say that based on the Daniel chapter 12 scripture that says that the beast kingdom lasts until the, 12, uh, until the 1290th day, but blessed is he that makes it to the 1335th day. So from 1290 to 1335, there's a 45 day period in there. Uh, and I'm personally at this point in my life, and I may change as I continue studying, but right now I'm thinking that the, these vials of wrath happen during that 45 day period. Is there any relationship between this and the angel that flies around the earth declaring the everlasting gospel? Like, if, if, if I'm thinking, like, that paired with they already know that God is doing it and they're still blaspheming. Right. Is there, have you seen any correlation between that? I, I think that the timing is there, right? The, the, the angel that had the everlasting gospel was during the, uh, which trumpet was it? Sixth? Was it the sixth or during the seventh? Seventh trumpet, wasn't it? Let's see here. Let's go find it. Um. I was just thinking if the if if the if the church is gone by that point, and this is still like God's way of showing them that He's real, and they know, but right. the church isn't there, it would make sense that an angel would be going around saying, "Believe this." And they know that God is the one behind all of it. Right. Yeah. I just didn't know if there was any For, timing behind that. So fourteen, chapter fourteen, verse seven, is the is the angel that declares the everlasting gospel. Um, what was that? Chapter fourteen, verse seven, is the everlasting gospel, and I think that could be because if you look at the if you look at the way this is written. 14.7 says that there was an angel of the everlasting gospel, giving the everlasting gospel, and right after that we have the two harvests. The one of Jesus harvesting the earth, or the one that looked like the Son of Man, harvesting the earth, and then the angel that throws the bodies into the winepress of God's wrath. Right? And, and I think that, and the, currently I think that the vials of God's wrath happen after, or like shortly after, or immediately after the catching away of the church. So, I think that that's quite possible. Now, having said that, the, old, the goal is to disprove what we believe, right? That's the goal. 
So let's talk about the other side of this conversation. There are two words for wrath in Scripture that are, that are referenced <clears throat> when it comes to the day of the Lord. The one is orge, and the other one is thumos. Thumos is God's hot breath. Like he's, man, boy. Man, I'm taking you to the woodshed. Hmm? T-H-U-M-O-S. Thumos. T-H-U-M-O-S. And the other one is orge, O-R-G-E. So the thumos of God is that hot displeasure, right? The orge of God is the executed judgment. We are in the thumos of God. This is the hot breath of God. This is not the executed judgment yet. The executed judgment of God comes after Revelation 19 when Jesus comes back. That's when Jesus executes judgment. He comes back with the sword of his mouth and he mows down those that are against him, right? <clears throat> we, Scripture says, we have been reserved from the wrath to come. Ta speaking of the church, we have been re reserved from the wrath to come. We have been reserved from the orge of God. It doesn't say that we've been reserved from the thumos of God. We are reading the vials of God's thumos, not the aisles of God, not the vials of God's orge, right? This is the vials of God's thumos, the vials of his hot breath. So we the scripture does not say that we have been delivered from this, that we've been kept from this. So we can't say, because there's a scripture that says we've been kept from the wrath to come, that since these are the vials of God's wrath, that we've been kept from it. No, because scripture says that we've been kept from the orge, the executed judgment of God. It does not say we've been kept from the thumos of God. Right. So, so from that vantage point, we can't use that scripture to say that the church won't be here. That scripture doesn't pan out here. The only reason that I'm saying that it's possible that the church is not here is because I don't see the church mentioned. Not even the remnant is mentioned, right? Nothing. It's just always about the unsaved, always about the kingdom of, of the beast. Another possibility would be, you know, in theory, in theory, we don't know this. This is Buck. Could the church be here and be preserved from these things? Like, could the water in the houses of the church be water and drinkable, but in everybody else's houses not? God can do whatever he wants, but we don't have any reference to that, right? But if you look back in Exodus, that is indeed what happened in Exodus. In Exodus, the water, the pots of water turned into blood in all of the Egyptian homes, but where the Jews were at, they had water to drink. So it could be that the church is just kept safe, during these times of God's hot displeasure, right? But we don't know. So if we're all here and we get to experience it, we'll update our knowledge and we'll find out, right? And we can send each other's email and say, hey, my buddy over here got a 100-pound hailstone through his roof. Did you guys get any? My house was kept safe. Nobody understands why, right? I keep telling my neighbors to trust in Jesus, but they just don't believe me. So now they don't have any houses, right? Could be. I don't know. So... Okay, so that is 16. Anybody have thoughts or questions or observations before we move into 17? I know we're going through this quickly. Uh, I, will just, I will just say this. At this point, I, where I'm at right now, and I have no way of proving this. This is totally buck, and I'm just telling you. Scripture is not specific. I do not have Scripture to say, based on this, 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 and this, it proves what I'm about to say. I can only tell you that based on what I've studied, I believe this to be true because it seems like everything intersects at this point. It really does seem to me that this happens after the church has been removed. It seems as if it does. And I think in the last 45 days of the beast's rule, maybe, or maybe a couple of months, something like that. But whatever it is, I don't think the time is... I think these happen quickly, and I, don't, and I think it's toward the end. So... My observation is it's a bad time to be an insurance adjuster. I would agree, yeah. There will be no such thing as insurance companies at that point. No, they will all be gone. Oh, no, they'll be yeah. paid double now. Yeah. Right, right. So, okay. So if we don't have any thoughts or questions, we're going to jump into, oh, shucks. Uh, would you do me a favor? Yeah. On my desk in my office, there are the little slips with the colored-coded kings. Can you grab the color-coded kings? Mm -hmm. Uh, if you're online, we're going to need your little color code uh, king slip that we had last week. I gave you, I emailed you, uh, yep, thank you, Diane. Uh, D, you're looking like you maybe don't have it. Do I need to put it out in the chat? I said it in the chat last week. Uh, let me go find the link and I'll post the link on the YouTube or on the, uh, uh, in the chat here. Let's see here. Let me go find it just real quick. I know that I sent it out. 
And it is, where is it at? Right there. Copy. Whoever's online, I will, uh, I'll pull it up so you can see it. And I'll also paste it in the chat so you've got it. <coughs> chat and paste. Boom. There you go. So you can click on that link that's in the chat. And it'll bring it up on your screen so you'll be able to see it. I'll also, sh I've got mine already. You're good. You can give it to somebody else that needs it. Uh, I will share my screen also here when we get ready to use it and you'll be able to see it. All right. I have a question about chapter 16. Okay. This is Aaron. Hi, Aaron. So, hey. Um, so, I just had a question because um, it mentioned a couple times that, you know, they poured out the, the bowl or the vial and they still did not repent. But at this point, don't all those people have the mark of the beast and could they not repent? I guess I'm just not really seeing the significance of John putting that comment. Gotcha. Yeah, so no, I don't think everybody at this point does have the mark. I think that there are people who've chosen not to, but who've still not given, who have still not repented, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think, like right now, what we're dealing with at this point, I don't think we can assume that, uh, that although I understand, I understand what you're saying, I'm not saying that what you said is bad, I'm glad you brought it up because I'm sure that other people are thinking the same thing. I don't think we can assume until the very end, like when humanity is finally judged. I think we have to leave the door open that there are people who have still not accepted the Lord, but who have still not taken the mark of the beast. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, all the way to the end. Because here's the reason I say that. When we get to the millennial kingdom and when Jesus comes to rule and reign, right? It says that Jesus rules and reigns over people for a thousand years which means there are survivors. And when you, look at, when you look at the last letter of the last church, the last church says this, uh, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of all creation of God. This is chapter 3, verse 14. I'm on 15 now. I know your works that you're neither hot or cold. I wish that you were hot or cold. So then because you're lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Because you say I'm rich and increase with goods, I have no need of anything, but you don't know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you might be rich, white raiment that you might be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness would not appear, and your eyes, and to anoint your eyes with eye salve that you might see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcomes, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sit, and sit with my father in his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I think that that, that that letter to the church is actually written specifically to the millennial church. Like, as I read these and I look at them, and I look at the, what was written to the churches, I think that the seventh letter applies to the group of people that are alive in that millennial kingdom. And if you look at the sixth letter of the church, it's written to the people that we saw in the sixth seal. I mean, it's like, if you look at the seals and you look at the letters to the churches, it's amazing how they overlap each other. It's just interesting. So I think when we, when we get to the end of, what? No, it's okay. When we get to the end, Jesus comes back to rule over a people. There has to be people who are alive because there's people here for a thousand years, because there's a, by the end of the thousand years, there are enough people that are alive to amass a massive army to have the Gog-Magog war, because they're tired of Jesus ruling over them and they want to get rid of him. So even at, after the thousand years of Jesus ruling the earth, he has to deal with people being rebellious, right? Um, these unsaved people? These would be, uns well, yeah, they would be unsaved people. At, when Jesus comes back, the only people that are on the earth would be the people either who were unsaved or who became saved after the rapture happened. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I think we always have to leave room for, I think we always have to leave room for people who are not part of the beast system, who, who don't want to be part of the beast, but who also don't want Jesus. They're just like, we don't want anybody to rule over us, period. I don't care who they are, right? And maybe some of those people will become born again. And I think Jesus is saying, you don't see that you're blind, naked, wretched, and poor. 
he's talking, I think, to that church in the thousand year millennial kingdom because these are all people that are hard headed, stubborn, spiritually blind individuals, and Jesus is begging them to pay attention, right? So, Aaron, thanks for bringing that up. I, I, think, uh, I think the reason he's saying that is because there are people. And that may be a way of saying, what is the scripture saying without saying it? The reason that he is saying that they're not repenting is because they still have the option to repent, but they're choosing not to. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, anybody else before we go on? I don't want to rush that any more than we need to. So that was a really good question. Okay, let's go into the next chapter. Okay, chapter 17, verse 1. There came one of the seven angels which had the seven, which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying to me, Come here, and I will show you the judgment of the great whore that sits on many waters. The great whore that sits on many waters. Now, the thing that I want to point out here is that there is no place so far in the Revelation that says that the whore sat on many waters. So, we're, being, we're treating this as if we have seen this before. The angel saying, come here and I'll show you the whore that sits on many waters. It seems to me like he's expecting us to somehow understand that this whore has indeed been exposed to, well, that's probably not a good way to say it, that, the, that this person or this entity, I should say, has been revealed to us, right, in a previous conversation. Well, the only thing so far that we've seen come out of the sea is what? The beast. We, have, we saw a beast come out of the sea with seven heads and ten horns. We saw that a little earlier. Uh, now, we're going to keep reading because I think it'll start to make a little bit more sense if we keep going. Uh, come here and I'll show you the judgment of the great whore that sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So, she's, so she, which by the way, spoiler alert, the whore of Babylon is a city. It's a city. Um, she has been in bed with the kings of the earth and the offspring, the outcome of their relationship is that the world has become drunk with what they produce. So the kings of the earth, so we're going to paint this in English terms as we go through this. Kings of the earth are dealing with a city someplace on the earth. At this point, we don't know where. And because of the dealings of the kings of the earth with this city, what that relationship produces between the kings and this city is enough to make the world intoxicated. Right? So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman. Now, now catch this. Where, did he, where was he before? Well, he was in the throne room. Remember, he was seeing the angels come out. He was watching the angels come out of the Holy of Holies with the vials, right? So John is currently, as he's starting to have this conversation, he's in the, basically he's in the throne room watching angels come out of the holy place. And so now he's being carried away in the spirit. And now he's out in the wilderness. And if you can imagine wilderness is like uh, uh, Arizona. That's wilderness, right? So he carried me away in the spirit to the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon the scarlet-colored beast, well, the, the, the barren area of Arizona. Not, I mean, I know there are pretty areas of Arizona too. but uh, uh, And I saw a woman sit upon the scarlet-colored beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, the beast that we saw before had seven heads and ten horns, but we were not told that it was scarlet. We were told that it looked like a leopard, that it had the feet of a bear, and the mouth of a lion. Here, we have a beast that has seven heads and ten horns, but it's identified as a scarlet beast. So the question is, are they the same? Was the scarlet left off the previous illustration, or the pre previous discussion, or are they two different beasts? They just both happen to have seven heads and ten horns. We have to keep reading to see if we can figure it out. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. So purple throughout scripture is used for royalty. Scarlet is generally used for affluence and sin. So if you look in Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 31, the, the virtuous woman, she dresses her home in scarlet, right? She, in other words, she spends the time, makes the color. Do you know, like a scarlet, to be able to dye something in scarlet 
took the carcasses of little worms and you had to get these little tiny worms <clears throat> and dry them and crunch them up and then that's what you would make scarlet dye out of. So it was one of those things, scarlet dye was, was not one of those things that people would just, they just had laying around. It, was, it took money, it took time, effort, process, right? So when you, when you see people dressed in scarlet, it's like those are people that are well taken care of. When you see purple, it's those are people who are considered royalty. Royalty was always used, or purple was always used for royalty. This woman is identified as somebody who is a royal individual who is affluent. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations of filthiness of her fornication. Upon her forehead, interestingly enough, where is the mark of the beast? On your forehead or your right hand? Where is the woman marked? On her forehead. Where are we marked? Where were the 144,000 marked? On their foreheads. There's something about that spot. It's prime real estate <laughs> right there, right? When you get marked, you are marked. The billboard of your body says, I belong to who? Finish the sentence. You're marked by God. You're marked by Satan that you wear it right there. Upon her forehead was the name written, <clears throat> Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints. In other words, she had drunk, she just had so much of it, she was bloated from it. Drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of martyrs of Jesus. And I saw her and wondered with great admiration. Now, if you've ever thought that a Christian that dies for their faith is considered a martyr, you get to correct your understanding. Because we have a verse right here that shows us this isn't the case. Because this woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of martyrs. Somebody who dies as collateral damage to a decision that happens to be a Christian is not considered a martyr. If, if uh, the beast, if the mark of the beast comes and you choose not to take it, which I hope all of us will say that we don't because none of us want to burn in the lake of fire, and we end up dying from starvation, that is not being martyred for the gospel. You are martyred for the gospel when you are taken in hand and you are told, sacrifice Jesus, refuse him, and you say no, and you're killed for not doing so. There's, it's a different thing. It's different. The collateral damage of Christians dying around the face of the earth through the, through the efforts of the beast are not... The, we, people who die as martyrs in the eyes of the Lord from my understanding of scripture, receive a greater reward from pe than the people that just die as believers. They have more to gain and they had more to lose. And if you look at, if you look at uh, Hebrews chapter 11, you see a number of names listed there of people who sacrificed their lives for their faith, right? Um, so anyways, just, just not that it matters in the grand scheme of things, we're gonna die when we die, right? But just know, if you're like, hey, you know what? I was thinking about this today when I was reading this, and I thought, you know, when the, when the uh, in Colorado, what was the school that had the shooting? Uh, Columbine. Columbine. Thank you. The Columbine shooting. There was a young girl there that was a believer and tried to witness to the kid to get him to put the gun down, to try to get him to stop, and was telling him about Jesus. And he shot her in the head because of her testimony. I think she was a martyr. I would. I mean, God knows, but I think she laid down her life for her peers and the gospel. And when he said to denounce Jesus, she refused to do it. And that's when he killed her. So that would be somebody who was martyred for their faith, you know, and if the family's watching this, I'm so sorry. But for those people who die during the beast kingdom, who are believers because of the policies of the beast, it doesn't mean that we're martyrs. So let's just keep going. Uh, when the angels, then the angel, verse seven, the angel said to me, wherefore did you marvel? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her that has the seven heads and the 10 horns. All right. So because it says the, the whore that sits on many waters, but we never have a picture of the whore sitting on water. <laughs> the only place that we have anything referencing something coming out of the water is the original beast that had seven heads and 10 horns. And, it, and it's that the woman is sitting on the beast. It may be 
that the woman was sitting on the beast that came out of the waters, and therefore she's the whore that sits on many waters. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. because, the, because the many waters are the peoples and populations of the earth, and the beast comes out of that. And here the woman is sitting on the beast, that she is sitting on the many waters because that's where the beast came from. That's one thought, right? Another possibility is that these are indeed, is that these are indeed two different beasts. <clears throat> I think that they are probably the same, but we'll keep going. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit. So what's the only thing that we have ever experienced so far that has the ability of intelligent thought that's come out of the bottomless pit? The angel. Everything else is creatures. We had the locust with the tails of scorpions that came out of the bottomless pit and went around, right? And the king over them was the angel of the bottomless pit. This verse right here is what draws our attention back to the fact that the angel of the bottomless pit is who we're talking about. The beast, that verse means a, that verse means a destroying entity. It's, it, and we see that he's identified as a destroyer, as a polyon and a badon. So I personally believe that this is referencing the beast that comes out of the bottomless pit, the angel. And the beast that you saw that the beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. That means it's going to go to judgment. Jesus, when he returns, throws the beast into the lake of fire, still in human form. The man who is the beast man is thrown into the lake of fire, and so is the false prophet. That we'll read about that when we get in later in the Revelation. And they that dwell on the earth will wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. So how can you be, how can you be a was and is not and a yet is? Something that existed in the past does not exist now, but still exists. <laughs> Doesn't that appear to be an oxymoron? So think about this. It makes complete sense. <laughs> The beast that was, is not, and yet is. Anybody want to take a stab at it? It's something Our that Trinity. you can't see. Like uh, yeah, that's on the right track. Something you can't see. Yeah. Um, so how about looking at it like this? Take a demon spirit. The demon spirit inhabits a beast or inhabits a person and rules as a king in a human body. He was. The, this demon spirit was a king on the earth. The demon spirit is not a king in the earth right now because it's currently locked into the bottomless pit. And yet it does exist. It still is, right? It's not a king, but it is because it still exists. It just doesn't happen to be inhabiting a man right now. So the beast was, is not, and yet is. Okay, so we're talking about the beast being the demon spirit. Remember when I told you there are five. The, the beast can be a demon spirit. It can be the man. It can be the little man. That's the false prophet. It can be a financial kingdom, and it can be a political kingdom. We're talking about the demon spirit right now. <clears throat> the beast that you saw was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Well, in other words, it was ruling on the earth. The beast was, is not ruling on the earth at the time of the writing of John, of the Revelation, and because it's been locked in the bottomless pit, and it will ascend out of the bottomless pit. Well, for it to ascend from the bottomless pit, if it was on the earth and it's ascending from the bottomless pit, something had to have stuck it in the bottomless pit. So we're looking at what Scripture is saying without saying it, right? So it was, has been stuffed in the bottomless pit for a day, time and year and season, is staying there. But it will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And we know from Daniel that the final world, world ruler does end up indeed going into perdition. It's called the son of perdition. The beast is called the son of perdition. They that dwell on the earth will wonder whose names are not written in the book of life. In other words, the people that are written in the book of life, we're going to see it for what it is. We're going to know. We're going to go, oh, that's the demon spirit inhabiting that man right there. We're going to see it. <clears throat> whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here's the mind that has wisdom. So here we go. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Now this could be one of a couple of things. 
Seven mountains could be, mountains are recognized as kingdoms in scripture. So a mountain is identified as a kingdom. It could be that the woman set on seven kingdoms and that her experience or that this demon spirit or whatever it carried over the expanse over seven kingdoms. Could be that. It could also be that the woman who happens to be a city is built on seven hills or seven mountains. Now Rome is known as a city built on seven hills, right? So lots of people look at this and they say, well, this is going to be Rome. But there are also other cities that are built on seven hills. Does anybody have an idea of a city in the United States that's built on seven hills? Denver. Seven hills? Um, I don't think Denver's on seven hills. That's a good guess, I think, though. So... Let me tell you these hills, and you tell me what city it is based on the seven hills that it sits on. Knox Hill, Hillcrest, Hillbrook, Forest Hills, Floral Hills, Meridian Hill, and Capitol Hill. Capitol Hill would be Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. happens to be built on seven hills. How many of you knew that? It's interesting that Staten Island is also built on seven hills. Ford Hill, Ward Hill, Fox Hill, Gypsum Hill, Ernest Hill, Tot Hill, and Richmond Hill. If you look, if you look at Albany, New York, happens to be built on seven hills. Uh, there are other cities in the United States that are also built on seven hills. So there are quite a few, actually. It's interesting. But... When we look at potential candidates for the Whore of Babylon, and I'm looking at this from an Americanized view, right? I have not studied how many, hill, how many cities. This is one of those things that I just need to do at some point. I've not studied the number of hills or the number of cities built on seven hills globally. Uh, I've only looked at the ones in the United States. But in the U.S., because I happen to believe that New York is the Whore of Babylon, personally, I think that's what it is, because that's where the U.N. is at, and we'll see here in a, in a little bit, I'll tell you why. <coughs> Uh, Washington, D.C. as our capital, I think, could fulfill the scriptures that we're about to read. So I'm just giving you a couple of scenarios. One is that it could be built on seven legitimate hills. It could also be that these are seven kingdoms through history and that, this, that the spirit of, that this, that this, that this, the, the essence of the city has, has, uh, existed through these various kingdoms. I don't think that's the answer, but I'm just throwing it out as a possible interpretation, right? Uh, so here's the mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains or hills on which the woman sits. And there are seven kings. Okay, so grab your little king sheet because we need to look at this while we're doing it. For you online, I'll share my king sheet. Okay, so, so you guys have your seven kings. You've got eight, actually. You'll see eight kings there. Okay, here's the mind that has wisdom. There are seven kings. Five are fallen. So you've got red, orange, yellow, green, and blue. Five have fallen, right? One is, so king six is right now at the time of the writing of the Revelation, and the other is not yet come. So seven is sometime in the future. So the red, orange, yellow, green, blue are all in the past. They've already happened. The light gray is the king we have now. And the medium gray or the darker gray is the one that's coming in the future. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. So that seventh king is only going to be a king for a little bit. Do you remember us talking about a king that only ruled for a little bit? Where was that at? Daniel chapter 11. We got over to verse 31, I think, 31, 32, and we were talking about the king that existed before the beast. Uh, or maybe it was verse 21. Somewhere in that first 20, somewhere between 20 and 30 in that range there. It says, And the king who shall come will be a raiser of taxes for the glory of the kingdom, but his kingdom will be cut short. He'll only be for a few days. He'll only be king for a few days, for a few years. And then will rise 
the final beast king, right? So, king seven, the one that comes must continue for a short space. That's the king that we're talking about just before the beast arrives on the scene. Now, we have an eighth king here, right? The beast that was and is not, talking about the demon, even he is the eighth, the eighth king, and he's of the seven. And he goes into perdition. So we're talking here, what this is saying is, the beast that was and is not, now let's think logically about this. So of the kings that we've got, the wases are the colors, and the is and will be's are the grayscale, right? That's the reason I put them color like that. King six can't be the demon because the scripture here says that he is not. Which means that the king, king six, can't be the king, can't be the demon. In other words, the demon spirit can't be living in king six right now because it says he was, is not, and yet is. So king six we can take off the loop. He can't be the, he can't be the king we're talking about. King seven, the one that's coming in the future, can't be it because otherwise it wouldn't be eight kings, right? Because it says even the one that will come, he will be the eighth, which tells us that the seventh king isn't him. So the two gray ones, we can take off the list. We know that that demon spirit is not going to be the king that existed at the time of the writing of the Revelation or the king that comes just before the beast, which means that the demon spirit and the beast king that we're talking about has to be one of the original five, one of the, one of the colors. He's got to be the, the red, orange, yellow, green, or blue king. So when this says, the beast that was and is not, he is the eighth, and he's of the seven and goes to perdition. It can't be the sixth or the seventh king because it's not the one that is and it's not the one that will be. Otherwise, he would be the seventh king, right? He wouldn't be the eighth king. So it's got to be one of the first five. So let's stop and talk about who those kings might be. The reason why, remember when we were talking about when John said, uh, here is wisdom, let him uh, who has wisdom count the, count the number of the beast for it's the number of a man and his number is... His number is 603 score and six. And I gave you that NRWN QSR verse, right? Nero, by this point, had just died maybe 15 years prior to the writing of the Revelation. So he was and is not. He was, hands down, the most demented king, hubris-filled elevated himself to God, named a month after himself so that humanity would not forget who he was. He, I think, from everything that I've ever read about him, I think he and Hitler would have been great friends. Filled with arrogance, filled with pride, no respect for life whatsoever, hated Christians and Jews, was determined to exterminate them, burned Christians at the stake in his courtyards to light up his parties at night. Had absolute zero affinity for Christians and Jews. None. I think that personally, I have no way of proving this, and we will only know when we see it happen, but I think that the demon spirit that inhabited Nero is the angel that was locked in the bottomless pit, and it is the spirit that's coming back in the beast man. I think it'll be the same demon. So when we read this, that he was, is not, and yet is, and that he was one of the previous five kings and that he will be the eighth king, I think that it's saying that we are going to re... I think, I think it's saying that we're going to experience Nero, the spirit that drove Nero, is I think what we're going to experience in the Beast King, personally. Now, I can't prove that. I'm just telling you what I think. And you all have to decide and walk away on your own and decide whether you think it's worth following or not. But having said that, when you look at the fact when you look at the absolute destruction, the arrogance, you look at the revel you look at Daniel, he elevates himself to the prince of princes. He elevates himself to the height of Jesus. He puts himself in the position of God. He declares himself to be God. He honors God, a God of forces, it says. I mean, there's just all sorts of things about this guy. He is demented, just demented. And it sounds like Nero. <clears throat> so, the beast that was and is not, he is the eighth and is of the seven and he goes to perdition. In other words, he'll be the last king and he'll be judged finally by Jesus. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings 
which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings for one hour with the beast. So, so we have, we know that a prophetic day is 360 days. We know that from Daniel. So if you were to take 360 days and convert that into hours and turn those into, how can I say this? <laughs> one hour of prophetic time is the equivalent to, uh, one hour of prophetic time is equal to 15 days. If you take 360 days divided by 24 hours a day, and take that portion, 360 divided by 24, that'll give you 15. So basically, these kings have a 15-day period, a two-week period, where they rule with the beast, and they give their power to him for, like, for two weeks. These have one mind and will give their power and strength to the beast. We've only got about five verses, and we'll stop for a break. These will make war with the Lamb. These will make war with the Lamb, verse 14. The Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he says to me, The waters which you saw where the whore sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So this is how we know what the water was earlier when we saw the beast coming out of the waters, right? And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the whore and will make her desolate and naked, and they will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So these ten kings are going to attack this city and destroy it. For God has put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. And the woman which you saw is that great city which reigns over the king of the earth. So let me summarize this chapter for you, and we're going to take a seven, eight-minute break. You have this beast that comes out that is, that is in and of itself, the body of this thing is the last king. It is the spirit, the demon spirit that's giving, and not life, but that's motivating this creature to existence. You have seven heads, which are seven kings and are also seven hills. So we see seven hills that the woman sits on, which could be Washington, D.C. It could be any city that's built on seven hills. It could be Rome. Uh, we also, but Rome doesn't meet the rest of the criteria that we're going to meet. We're going to read in the next chapter. There are certain criteria that you have to have. The city has to be a port city, for example. It's got to be on the edge of water. Rome is not. Uh, Rome is not on. Is Rome on water? Am I missing it? I don't think it is. It's inland. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, my geography is horrible, but I don't think it is. Um, and don't laugh, everybody online. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> But you've got, it's got to be a port city. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But so you've got this city that, that whores with the kings of the earth, creates pleasures and woos them into pleasure, right? The population of the world is wooed, intoxicated with the outcomes that these kings and this city produce. Uh, this demon spirit comes, inhabits this leader, we have the ten horns that are ten kings. We have the beast itself. And we end up having the whore that's sitting on the city is riding the beast system. The city is on top of it, right? It's riding it. The beast is under the whore. And she is, is quite happy having her golden chalice full of the blood of saints, drunk with the blood of saints, making money, living in affluence, seen as royalty, just being an absolute heathen, right? And she's sitting on top of the beast, and the ten horns are on the head, and this beast wants the whore off of it. And pretty soon, you can imagine, he wheels his head back and takes the ten horns and just gores her, with the ten horns to destroy her, does what it has to do to get her off of its back. So we have this picture that the beast is being ridden by the whore, by this city, it's controlling it in essence, and the whore, or and the beast does not want to be controlled by the whore. The beast wants the whore off its back. And so by the end of it, 
these 10 kingdoms, these 10 kings join together and they decide we're going to come together in unity and we are going to burn the horror and we're going to eat its flesh. That's what it says.